When I was a child, maybe seven or six years old, my parents gave me a coloring book. Coloring book like this. And wow, it was my only game for weeks. I colored everything and I also had my mom cut out the planes and stick them on a mirror in my old room. I was watching the planes all the time and questions started to form in my young mind, so many that I didn't even have the words to express them. Finally, one day, I managed to formulate the most important question in my life so far. So I asked my dad, Daddy, why some planes have wings long and thin and others are like a triangle? Look, they're like arrows. Well, I didn't know the term delta wing at the time. My dad answered, I don't know what you're talking about, son. They all look the same to me. The universe crumbled into shards in that precise moment, and I'm still not sure it is back in one piece today. There and then, I learned that my dad didn't know everything. Here and now, you will learn why so many fighters today are designed with Delta Wings. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay till the end because the stuff that you learn here, you don't find anywhere else on YouTube. The origin of the Delta Wing go back to Germany in the late 30s, but it was in the 50s that engineers became really interested in the Delta Wing all around the world. It was 1952 and in France, Marcel Dassault was commissioned the first French supersonic operational plane. And the request from the French Air Force was clear. What they wanted, above anything else, was speed. Dassault at the time was developing the successful Mystère with swept back wings which will enter service in 1954. So the first thought was to refine the Mystère, developing a new wing optimized for the supersonic flight. More sweep and a lower thickness to chord ratio was required, but after their calculations they realized that the resulting wing would have been just 10 cm thick. A wing like that can be built, of course, but it will have no room for fuel, no room for the undercarriage, and it would be structurally very heavy because, yes, Thin wings are heavier than thick wings, but, well, this is a different story. Obviously, Dassault was not a man to give up so easily. He stripped the mystery of its wing and he adopted a Delta plan for it. And it was love at first sight. The result was the Mirage I, the forefather of the Mirage fighter family. Various iterations followed suit and when the new fighter was pitched against the Etendard, the alternative being developed for the French Navy with a conventional wing, well, the French Air Force had no doubts. The Mirage was more difficult to fly, had a smaller payload and landed at a scaring speed of 330 km per hour, requiring very, very long runways. But it was amazingly fast, easily reaching Mach 2 under the thrust of the new Snecmatar turbojet. The Cold War was fought in the sky by three great warriors, the American F-4 Phantom, the Soviet MiG-21 and the French Mirage 3. And guess what? All three of them had a Delta platform wing. Something that is often overlooked is that not all the planes that have a wing shape like a delta actually have a delta wing. Wings produce lift because the pressure on the lower side is higher than the pressure above. This is true in general for delta and no delta wings. A conventional wing produces lift because its section is shaped like an aerofoil. This is a shape that forces the air to move faster on the upper side than the lower side, creating a suction which is called lift. The aerofoil is probably the most important feature of the wing, defining much of its performance. Delta wings, however, are different. As one of my professors at university used to say, they do not have a leading edge, they only have a trailing edge 
all around. At very low angles of attack, the air flows in a way similar to a conventional wing, but at low alpha, the wing doesn't produce much lift. As soon as you start increasing the angle of attack, something strange and unique happens. Two vortices start to detach from the root of the wing along the wing forward edge and above the wing itself. The airflow gets separated, it creates two very quickly spinning regions of air. Since the core of the vortices is spinning very fast, it creates a low pressure region that sucks the wings upward, generating extra lift. The almost miraculous aspect is that the vortices are quite stable and the whole wing is stable as well pitch and roll. Understanding intuitively why it happens is not very easy. You may think that if the pressure on the lower surface is higher than the pressure above, the flow below the wing is deviated toward the wingtip. This is the phenomenon that generates the wingtip vortices that you can often see during the air shows. If the wing is swept back at angles of 50 degrees or above, you may imagine that the flow below the wing leaks on the upper surface before reaching the wingtip, causing the separation and the vortex formation that you find above delta wings. So proper delta wings have a thin leading edge that promotes the formation of the vortices even at relatively small angles of attack. Actually, a large part of the aerodynamic design of a proper delta is devoted to controlling the formation and the position of the vortices that in a real-world situation do not detach directly from the root, but they will detach at the intermediate point on the leading edge. Planes like the Rafale, the Gripen or the already mentioned Mirage 3 have a true delta wing. Planes like Eurofighter, Typhoon or the A4 have a delta-like platform, but the wing has a thickish airfall with a rounded leading edge and tend to work more like a normal wing. Actually, modern wings like the Eurofighter may behave in a sort of intermediate way, flying with an attached flow at low alpha and generating vortices at high alpha, having, well, the best of both worlds. advantage of the delta wing in the 50s or the 60s was, was connected with speed. The lesson learned from the Korean War was that speed was decisive in air combat. So almost every new design was focused on squeezing all the speed possible. Deltas have uh, several advantages in this respect. For example, the transonic drag rises more gently and the peak supersonic drag is lower than a conventional design. So passing Mach 1 requires less thrust and causes less shaking. Also, the lift coefficient increases and decreases smoothly with the Mach number with no abrupt variation in transonic region. The wave drag is reduced because of the high sweep and thin wing sections. The high sweep also means that the wing is inside the main shock wave, avoiding interference that causes extra drag. The large wing root toward, if compared with traditional designs, spreads the lift much more, reducing the associated drag, and makes the application of the area rule relatively simple. The area rule in itself is a complex subject, but you may think that the drag can be reduced making the fuselage thinner where the wing is thicker. Overall, a delta wing fighter is aerodynamically very clean, allowing quick acceleration and high speed, and this was the reason why it was adopted in quite a large number of designs in the 50s and the 60s. Delta wings also have various other advantages. For example, the stall is mild and happens at a very high angle of attack due to the lifting vortices. The low aspect ratio and high taper allow for a very stiff but light structure with internal room for fuel and the undercarriage. The large wing area produces a low wing loading which fosters maneuverability and handling particularly at high heart. Finally, there is a large underwing area for the external store as it appears quite obvious even from modern design. So if everything was good, why the delta wing configuration did not replace more conventional ones? 
Well, there are no free lunches and Delta Wings also have some rather important drawbacks. The Delta Wing, while having a low drag, is not very efficient as a lifting body. The lift increases slowly with the angle of attack and this means that the plane must be flown at a quite high alpha to generate the same lift and this creates a whole lot of issues. To avoid tail strikes, takeoff and landing speeds are high, airfield performance is poor and any external load added makes the problem even worse. While the Delta Wing has a benign behavior at transonic and supersonic speed, at subsonic speed the high angle of attack required to compensate the low lift means that a lot of drag is generated as well. In practice the pilot ends up with a relatively small range of usable alphas and he or she has to pay a lot of attention to not increasing it too much and wasting speed and energy. This situation is made even worse by the fact that the trailing edge controls need a constant deflection in flight to maintain the plane stable. This generates a non-negligible, actually rather important train drag, though this is less of a problem with the delta wings with a horizontal tail lag -like than MiG-21. Eh? A Delta Wing fighter, like every plane, needs to be stable and the condition for stability is that the center of gravity must be ahead of the aerodynamic center. While in a Delta Wing the aerodynamic center doesn't move much with speed and angle of attack, it moves enough to require a complex trimming to compensate the variation of the pitching torque. Uh, planes like the Concorde or the B-58 Hustler uh, got to the point of moving fuel from different tanks to move the center of gravity closer to the aerodynamic center and reduce the necessity of trimming uh, with the elevons. The drag generated in this way was definitely not negligible and particularly at subsonic speed. When in the 60s the focus began shifting from pure speed to ordnance load and airfield performance, the most important advantage of Delta Wing, the, that is the supersonic performance, was not so important anymore and so the solution was slowly abandoned. The season of the variable sweep wing began, but as we're going to see, it was not destined to last long. Yes, because something else was happening at the same time and it was a game changer. In the first half of the 70s, actuators and the theory of control had progressed enough to create control solutions where the pilot input was decoupled from the control surfaces. The so-called fly-by-wire was born. Soon after, computers became fast enough to implement the flight mechanics equations and to be used to control the plane. The pilot no longer just deflected the surfaces, just told the computer the type of maneuver it desired and the computer commanded the actuators to deflect the surfaces to obtain the required result. This was a radical shift because it gave the designers a freedom that was impossible with conventional commands. The computer could maneuver the plane faster and with more accuracy than any pilot could and in particular it was no longer necessary to have a stable design because the computer could maintain the plane stable by continuously adjusting its trajectory, something that no pilot could do safely. In this new era, it was no longer necessary to keep the center of gravity well ahead of the aerodynamic center to guarantee stability. Planes could be designed with a neutral stability with the two centers in close proximity. On a conventional wing configuration, this is very useful to improve the handling, but on a delta wing, it also crucially reduces the nasty train drag that we have mentioned before to almost nothing. And this is not everything, if the center of gravity is coincident or slightly behind the aerodynamic center, the elevons on the trailing edge need to produce a force directly upward to compensate the torque. This means that the lift of the wing can be lower because it has to compensate just the weight and not only the weight plus the negative lift at the back of the wing. This in turn means that the wing can be flown at angles of attack lower than a stable delta. 
Finally, computer control slats became possible to improve the slope and the lift curve at different fly, uh, conditions, further reducing the need of high angles of attack to generate the lift. As you can see, artificial stability fixed the worst problems of the delta wing configuration, reducing the various additional drag components generated by the need of high angles of attack. Designers all around the world quickly realized this, and in the early 80s the delta wing made its comeback. The Mirage 2000, for example, demonstrated minimum speeds of about 100 km per hour, together with maximum speeds of about Mach 2.2. The Eurofighter Typhoon, the Swedish Gripen, the French Rafale, the aborted Israeli Levy, the Indian Tejas, the Chinese J10 and J20, the Sukhoi 57, all of them are Delta designs. So the answer to the initial question of why so many modern fighters use a Delta wing is that artificial stability heavily reduces or thoroughly eliminated the issues of the Delta wing, leaving basically only the advantages. It is not a universal solution yet and we will see in another video why other configurations still exist, but it has become the most optimized aerodynamic configuration that the fighter may have according to our current level of knowledge. Also, you may have noticed that another element has become ubiquitous with the delta wing. These small surfaces here at the front, the canards or four planes. Obviously, there is a reason why they are there, but this will be the subject of the next video. In the meanwhile, if you like this video, these other videos beside me could be interesting as well. Please subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss anything. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.